Hello, everyone, and welcome to 3 o'clock with SOC. Give me just a second so I can welcome those who want to access the program in Spanish to our conference call with Spanish interpretation. Buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí en 3 p.m. con SOC. Como siempre, ustedes pueden escuchar el programa en español a través de una llamada de conferencia. Y el número aparece aquí en la pantalla y es 646-749. 3122 y el código para entrar es 779-328-221. Y ahora les voy a dejar con nuestra querida Marlene, quien va a ser nuestra moderadora de hoy. Um, thank you for letting me do that. I'm going to leave you in the hands of our beloved Marlene, who is going to be the moderator for today. Hi, everyone. Uh... My name is Marlene Zaran. Welcome to Three O'Clock with Sock today. I am the COVID-19 Project Coordinator and the uh, Forum Coordinator for the Southside Organizing Center. Uh, I just want to let you all know that the uh, staff and platforms for Sock are still available virtually, not in person, uh, but you can definitely contact us at 414 six seven two eight zero nine zero if you have any questions or you need any assistance with finding resources in the community um you can also email us at soc at soc milwaukee.org and you can visit our website at soc milwaukee.org to get any further um uh, information about uh, uh elections uh, covid19 etc uh, so that being said, um, we'd love for you all to complete the SOC survey that we have. The SOC survey allows us to gather information about how we're doing um, for the forum. So you can ask us, you know, oh, I'd love to get more information on this topic, or I'd love it if you guys brought this guest on uh, to talk about this certain topic. Uh, so we love to get the feedback. We love to know how well we're doing, what else we can do to improve. So um, just let us know. You can complete that survey. We need at least five individuals to complete it. So if you can go ahead and do that, that would be really amazing. Um, that being said, I am currently working from home. So all of SOC staff is working virtually from home. And that is why you see us on the screen without a mask on while we are doing the forum. Um, so I would love to get an idea of who is actually here um, and watching. So if you can say hello in the comment section, that would be amazing. Or even just put in an emoji, your favorite emoji, um, anything so we know who our viewers are every single day. Uh, so uh, just a quick disclaimer that the views and opinions shared today do not necessarily reflect those of SOC. That being said, I'm going to go into our announcements section just to give you a quick announcement that today is COVID-19 day. Our feature segment today is Claire Evers. She is the um, Deputy Commissioner of Environmental Health from the Public Health Department in Milwaukee. Um, for the rest of the week, tomorrow is Friday, and we have our guest, Carissa Givens. Uh, she is the Milwaukee Community Program Manager <clears throat> from Wisconsin Bike Fed, and she's going to be talking about safe and healthy the Safe and Healthy Streets Initiative, which is really interesting right now. Uh, that being said, I'd like to move on to our main guest, Claire Evers. Uh, again, she is the Deputy Commissioner of Envi Environmental Health at the Public Health Department. And we're going to essentially get some COVID-19 updates from her. And we're going to go over the Milwaukee Public Health Department dashboard so everyone can better learn how to get COVID-19 data and updates um, on their own. So um, hello, Claire. Hello. Hey. Okay. So first, um, I did introduce you, but if you would like to kind of explain your role with COVID-19 in Milwaukee, um, so then people can kind of get a better understanding of what um, you do uh, in regards to COVID-19. 
Sure. So one of the areas I oversee at the Milwaukee Health Department is emergency preparedness and general environmental health. And within emergency preparedness is the COVID-19 um, response. And so our team is split up where uh, each of us oversee a particular area. A lot of what I oversee is the moving Milwaukee forward safely orders, um, as well as the compliance and enforcement that goes along all uh, goes along with that order. We also in um, our division handle the testing sites. So I'm gonna go over today some of the changes in our testing sites, um, as well as our isolation facilities. So those are the areas related to COVID that kind of fall under my area. Um, the other areas of the COVID response related to testing and contact tracing fall under our medical services branch. Awesome, uh, that's great. Uh, so let's talk about, um, what are the current COVID-19 numbers? So I'm going to do yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, um, so I, I don't know if people have heard so far, but we are kind of seeing, um, we're seeing a third wave uh, go in, around in the city and the state. Um, our local numbers aren't as concerning as more north of us and the central state, but we're starting to see a concerning trend increasing in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, so I will go over the numbers in specifics. And then after that, I'm gonna kind of go over some resources that we have. Um, so how the city works out our moving Milwaukee forward safely orders is we have gating criteria. Mm -hmm. And so once we see any of the criteria going into the, the red section, that is the, the worst indicator we can have. We wanna see them in the green. Um, so last week we saw our cases and our testing indicators move into the red. And so that was from yellow and they are still in the red. And then we have seen um, our, our hospital capacities go from green to yellow. So they have also moved in the wrong direction. Um, so it's just important, you know, I always wanna make sure to say that COVID is highly infectious and it does affect all areas of our city. And so it's really important that individuals follow social distancing and our hygiene guidelines in order to slow the spread. So our African-American population has been impacted heavily um, and it comprises about 29.4% of the total cases in Milwaukee. Um, the zip code that has the highest amount, the most cases is 53215 on the south side with a total of 4,917 confirmed cases. And when we look at the dashboard, there's an area to see um, by zip code, uh, the, the number of cases and it's in a heat map. And so the heat map just shows in relation to other areas of the city, there isn't one indicator or one criteria that pushes you into like a hotter zone. It's just meant to show you how your zip code or a certain zip code compares with the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh. quick share the screen and then we can walk through that. Oh, perfect. Okay, one second. All right, so this is the, oh, this is the main view. Can you see it? Um, just close it. Yep. Okay, so this is the map that um, uh, Claire Evers is speaking about. So if you click on the link that we put in the comment section, you you can scroll down and you get right to this dashboard. And then she was referring to the heat map, which is this map right here. Um, am I correct? Yes. Yep. You're right on. Okay. So then if you zoom in, um, you can kind of direct me in what you want to look at. Sure. So when you when you see um, the different colors, the more pronounced the color or the darker the color is, that is an area that is more heavily impacted. So when you see the lighter areas, that's where the burden is not as, as much as once you get into the the darker colors. So as you can see, it's really the south side of Milwaukee. It goes into South Milwaukee and St. Francis also um, are seeing really high, a high number of cases, but you can click on the census track or the zip code and it will show you the number of cases per 100,000. Um, for reference, the CDC guidance for like the highest risk um, numbers for school are 200 per 100,000. So that kind of gives you a reference of um, kind of the severity of the, the illness in any certain area. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah that's right there where you're highlighting. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. 
Um, and then this is essentially the 53215 and 53204 zip codes, correct? Right. Okay. I don't know what just happened, sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. Um, so then um, the neighboring zip codes of, of the 53215, it's uh, 53204 has about 3,180 cases, and then 53221 has 1,516. Um, mm -hmm. And we look at the Hispanic population accounts for about 33.6% of all the confirmed cases in the city of Milwaukee, um, and that is a number of 8,894. Mm. Um, the most vulnerable population is still our 65 and plus age group. Um, that makes up 8.4%. Uh, we're on a call today with the county medical director talking about death rates. Um, we are seeing an increase in the 80 plus age group death rates. Um, and that goes along with the increased hospitalization that we're seeing. The mm. age group with the most cases remains our 25 to 34 year old age group, which is about 22.2% of the the cases. Um, we ha did receive a school age report today, which shows um, a continued negative trend in children who are testing positive. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I don't believe that that's laid out on the dashboard uh, that you have in front of you, but you are able to see the a lot of the information that we talk about talks about the seven day average. And so that's really what you want to be looking at. Um, when you're looking at the information, yeah. you don't want to go just by a day. Um, you want to go by a seven day average because sometimes there's a delay in reporting. So if you go back to the main screen. So down on the bottom left, you'll see the seven day average of positive mm -hmm. cases by day. Um, that is really a good a good indicator where you want to look at the average of cases. So you can see it kind of goes in waves there. Um, and towards the right is where we're seeing this new peak coming up. So early on in the response, um, only symptomatic sick individuals were getting tested. So the positivity rate was a lot higher in the beginning because only sick, sick people got tests. Um, now we have testing available for people who are asymptomatic as well. And so it's a more accurate picture of the actual positivity rate. Um, but what we're seeing now, it's getting a little more concerning. You can see that there's also a tab for daily increase that you can see. So there's different ways to look at the information, but it's really a powerful tool for those of you at home to just kind of keep a close eye on what, what is going on. And it's a good reminder of, um, you know, what you do in your daily life really is affecting the community and community spread. Mm -hmm. And right here where it says like, it says 460, is that, what does that represent? 460? The 466 per 100,000 people, I believe. So this one is the county website. So um, the city one is just a little bit different, but um, I believe that's the 466 per 100,000. Okay, so this is where we started in March. Uh, the it's increased up to here. Okay. Um, yeah, there is also another dashboard. Um, we can go over that another day. Uh, which one do you feel is more accurate? I mean, not accurate, but... Yeah, so um, depending, you know, if your viewers are from all over the county, I think the county one is really good because it'll give information about this outside of the city as well. Mm -hmm. um, the city, the, our city gating criteria relies on this Milwaukee County one for two of the indicators. So um, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a tab for indicators, um, key indicators. So that's what I was talking about for our cases, our testing, care, PPE, and tracing. Mm -hmm. um, so the city has a separate dashboard, but all, but uses the county data for PPE and tracing because it is inclusive of all the hospitals in the area. So that's why it's important. But the both dashboards are the similar as of the updates today. So we're mm -hmm. all um, red in cases and testing. And testing isn't red because we aren't doing enough testing. Testing is red because our percent positive has increased above 10%. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe the daily rate yesterday was 11.8% positive, which is nearly, nearly the highest we've seen since we've had asymptomatic testing. So that is a bit concerning. Um, I know some states have put us on their do not travel list once we hit 10% positivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe New York has... Um, 
claim that, you know, if you do enter Wisconsin, you need to go into quarantine when going back to New York. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Illinois does too right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Illinois too. They released um, something a, a couple of months ago actually saying that if you are coming in from Wisconsin, you need to quarantine for 14 days. So, yeah. um, this is great. So, I mean, based on, you know, we're in red in cases and testing and tracing um, and yellow in care and PPE, these have uh, gone down, you know, like uh, – they're not. They're no longer green. A couple of weeks ago, we were. Some of them were in the green markers, um, and we were saying we seem like we're good to go. But now you're saying there's a increase of cases. Um, why do you feel that is um, with like the current situation? Yeah, it's really you know kind of shocking how quickly things have turned. You know, like you said, a couple of weeks ago we were feeling really good. And we're like schools open. You know, we're still in a good mm-hmm. place. But one thing to remember is that the actions we take today, they may not affect us for another two weeks because there is that two week incubation period. So it could be two to four weeks before if someone makes a very bad decision on something that, you know, they may be hosting a large party or something like that. And that may two to four weeks from now may really show show up in our data. So what we're seeing um, nationwide contributing to these increases are smaller gatherings and people, um, individual behaviors. It's not so much that, you know, going out to restaurants is causing this. It's more of people having barbecues or even smaller weddings of 100 people or so. Um, Those types of activities are really contributing to these increases. Um, And there's a lot of COVID fatigue out there. People are really sick of having to deal with it. People are feeling bad for their kids, not being able to see their friends or do their regular Mm -hmm. activities. So people are making the decision to have riskier behaviors, you know, and I don't, and I don't blame people, but we really need to tighten it up. We're getting into the winter months where people are going to be indoors and we're really seeing a high number of cases and seeing, um, You know, the alternative care facility opened up last week. We are now seeing patients at the state fair uh, site. And those aren't because our hospitals down here are overcrowded. It's because hospitals north of us have reached their max capacity and are now sending patients down. So I think it's just really a time that people are reminded of the severity of the illness. Um, We're seeing reports now that people are having more long-term effects from COVID. We're seeing diabetes um, is turning out to be one of the long-term effects in children and adults. Um, and that's a lifelong illness. And so we really want to make sure the message is getting out to make be smart about the decisions that we're making. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, we are currently doing these action groups with SOC, um, with in partnership with the uh, 16th Street Clinic United Community Center. Um, and bit. So far from the data, we've uh, completed about three action groups, which they're like focus groups. And we have about 10 individuals per focus group. And a lot of the data is saying um, it is fatigue. It is mental health fatigue. Yeah. Um, but I'll, another part of it is um, other uh, part was hypocrisy. And individuals are saying, um, you know, people are, following the rules, uh, you know, when they're work, going to work and stuff, but then after they're done with work, they are, you know, going to hang out with their friends on a Friday and Saturday. Uh, yeah. So it, it it does have a huge impact. And there's we're seeing that there is a cultural impact from the uh, Latinx community that it's uh, because the Latinx community is very family oriented. And so um, it's hard to kind of break that behavior. Um, so yeah, we're seeing uh, data of that sort. Uh, and definitely, if you would like, we can share that with you once we have it all completed. Um, we've also interviewed some youth as well. So we're getting a youth perspective as well. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. It's very interesting seeing um, what uh, individuals are currently believe, and a lot of uh, the families that and friends that, of people that we're interviewing, um, some are saying we do follow 
the regulations for the CDC, but then we have friends that are hanging out together and they're enjoying their time together and I get invited, but I don't go, you know? So yeah. uh, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. And then there's also that kind of like that shame aspect um, that, you know, that COVID-19 is not real. There's that misinformation out there as well. And individuals who are following COVID-19 regulations um, might be getting shamed for following these regulations. Yeah, uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, so there's lots of uh, different aspects to that. Um, but yeah, hopefully there's some data and we try to create um, some campaign information to get individuals to cooperate. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And we really appreciate that information because then we can kind of focus our communication efforts where there might be a void or misinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're looking to interview about the individuals. So once we complete all of that in the next week, um, uh, we'll be analyzing all the data and finding the themes and then we can share it with you and we can also share it with the public so the individuals can get a better idea of what's happening and it, it's coming from the community members themselves like this is the truth of what is happening yeah 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 um okay sorry i just went on a tangent about that um, no, that's okay. yeah um so uh, we went over phases um uh, is, is Wisconsin currently very high in numbers compared to other states in the U.S.? Yeah, it is. Um, it is one of, it's been the last couple of weeks, one of the, the top four, I think, states in the country um, for our increasing number of cases. Um, the Fox Valley and Green Bay area, as well as Wauw not Wauwatosa, um, Walk I can't remember the name, Wapaka, the Wapaka area. Um, mm -hmm. Those are seeing really high increases right now. Um, and oh. around Milwaukee, the suburbs are seeing a lot of really high increases. Oh, oh, interesting. So do you feel, I mean, based on what you know, the data are, because I remember in like the north of Wisconsin, kids were really low. Yeah. So now, now they've increased. Exactly. Yeah. It, and I think, a lot of it has to do with uh, um, non-compliance with social distancing and mask wearing. I think um, to your point before that there are a lot of people who feel that COVID doesn't exist or that it doesn't matter if you get it, that it's not a big deal. And so I think that those areas also public health isn't supported in a way that they can have orders or really strong guidance and have any sort of enforcement or follow up. So I think they're really limited in that. The governor's order for the mask mandate, the way it's written, it's enforced by public health. And if public health doesn't have administrative support in their local jurisdiction to write citations or to follow up, um, th then there's there's no enforcement tied to it. So a lot of times uh, people and businesses aren't complying. And now, the, now public health has gotten to the point that they are in a critical stage that they don't have, like a lot of areas don't even have the staff to do contact tracing. They're only calling the person who is positive. They're not even contacting the contacts to tell them to quarantine. They're expecting the patient, the positive case, to do that on their own. Um, that's not occurring in the city of Milwaukee, but in our neighboring areas it is because public health is so strapped for um, staff that they're just not even able to do the contact tracing in other areas. Right. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Oh, Claire, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I don't know. Okay. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, you can answer this or skip it if you would like. Um, but do you feel that there is a political resistance to following COVID-19 regulations? due to it does certainly recent election events. It certainly seems that way. I don't know that we have any data to support that, but it certainly seems that way. Yeah. 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 We've we've gotten some um 
from the action groups that we've interviewed community members. Um, some of the youth were actually saying this is a, a, a political issue as well. Not only is it a public health issue, but it's, it's being driven by a political point of view. And that's why cases are increasing as well. Um, so, yes. Uh, so where can people get more information? Sure. So I wanted to add, um, so our, our traditional National Guard testing sites have closed last week. Um, we have opened local testing sites. So the testing sites are at our two health center locations, the Southside Health Center at 1639 South 23rd Street has both COVID testing and also has free flu vaccines, anyone ages six months and older. The other location is at our Northwest Health Center at 7630 West Mill Road. Um, and again, it is for COVID testing as well as free flu vaccines. Um, you do not need to be symptomatic. You do not need to have been exposed. You don't need to have health insurance or any of that to be able to um, participate in, in those um, testing sites. Um, we do have resources for Halloween coming up. I know that's a really big topic. Um, I won't get too much into it. Um, the city does not sanction a, a traditional trick-or-treat Halloween um, going door to door to get uh, to get candy. But if you want to look at um, it's Halloween2020.org, it gives a lot of safe options for trick-or-treating. Um, oh, and I didn't mention the Miller Park has also opened up as a free COVID testing site. It's a drive through site op open to anyone five ages or older. However, that site does not have the flu vaccines. It's Monday through Friday, 11 to 6. Um, and there is also a free shuttle to that testing site. Um, it runs primarily along Wisconsin Avenue um, and it is Monday through Friday, 1030 to 6. Hi, everybody. So we are less than two weeks away from the election, and I just want to make sure everyone's aware of the deadlines that are coming up and other information to make sure that everyone knows all the opportunities they have to register to vote and to vote successfully in this election. So starting on the top left, now through October 23rd, you can request your absentee ballot. And although October 29th is the legal deadline to request absentee ballots, it's not recommended to wait that long to request an absentee ballot. We know that we just wanna give as much time as possible for people to request it, receive it from the election commission and send it back in time or drop it in a drop box in time for those votes to be counted. But voting by mail is a very, very effective way to vote. Many states do this exclusively. So please don't um, be hesitant to vote by, by mail and request your absentee ballot if you wanna stay safe and vote from home. And again, that link to request your absentee ballot always appears in our comments. It also appears at the top right of this flyer, bit.ly slash sock vote. So go there to request your absentee ballot, either today or tomorrow is the best time to do it. Um, under that, October 14th was the last day to register to vote by mail or online, but there are still ways to register to vote. So you can register to vote at an early voting site that I will share in just a couple minutes. You can register to vote on the day of the election at your designated polling site and let us know if you don't know where that is and we can help you find it. And you can also register to vote until October 30th at the clerk's office at 200 East Wells Street. Um, so those are three options that you have to register to vote if you are not registered yet. Right next to October 14th, starting October 20th and through November 1st, you can vote early. So like I said, you can register to vote at an early voting site and you can vote before the election in person through these different voting sites. And for the South Side, those locations are Zablocki Library, Mitchell Street Library, Tippecanoe Library, and Bayview Library. 
The times for Zablocki Library are Mondays through Fridays, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then Mitchell Street, Tippecanoe, and Bayview Libraries are available to early vote Mondays and Tuesdays, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, 1 p.m. to 7 p.m., and then Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, so then above that, you can see October 27th is the practical deadline to return your absentee ballot by mail. So if you request your absentee ballot and you don't get it until October 27th or, you know, at the end of next week, do not send it by mail. You'll want to send it, you'll want to turn it into one of the drop boxes that are available at those same locations that I just mentioned. Um, and if you have any issues getting your witness signature on the absentee ballot envelope, people at those Dropbox sites at the libraries are available to sign as your witness. And then we can see next to that, October 29th is the legal deadline to request your absentee ballot. Again, we are not suggesting that anybody wait this long to request it, but you are allowed to request it up until October 29th. Then, Again, November 1st will be the last day that early voting is available at those locations. And then November 3rd is election day. So if you have any questions about how you can vote successfully in this election, if you wanna know where your polling place is, if you need help knowing how to prove your, your residence. So if you're registering to vote for the first time, you need to bring proof of residence. Any questions like that, please don't hesitate to reach out or comment in our comment section to make sure that you know how to vote successfully in this election. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Sorry, I had some technical difficulties earlier and my internet stopped working, but I am back. Let me just see if we have any hellos in the comments. Um, all right, I don't see any hellos, but I would love for our viewers to say hi um, or leave their favorite emoji if they can. Um, so we just went over the um, civic update, but we're gonna give you a quick coronavirus update on ways to boost your immune system. By now, you have undoubtedly heard the calls from health officials to exercise proper hygiene in the face of the global threat of COVID-19. Washing your hands, not touching your face, coughing in your elbow, or using tissues for those sneezes and coughs will go a long way in helping to prevent you from contracting the new virus or far more common flu viruses. Prevention may be the first strategy, but if you come in contact with a virus, your body does its work as well. The immune system and the body is a natural defense that would kick into gear. Think of it as your army, ready to fight off diseases that do enter your system. Which is why now is the best time to strengthen your immune system. It is important to consume certain foods to um, boost our immune system, specifically to improve our white blood cells levels since these tend to help us prevent infections. Nutritionist Dora Sutherland says some of the essential nutrients for a healthy immune system are vitamins A, C, D, zinc, and probiotics. You want to start off with always having foods that contain vitamin D. Okay, vitamin D tends to alert the, the body when there is, it's in contact with a certain type of infection. Mm -hmm. Okay, you find vitamin D foods in, for example, fish, you find it in eggs, you find it in milk and sardines, or you could also find it in fortified cereals that have vitamin D. Okay, okay. what is also important is foods that have vitamin A and vitamin C. Okay, mm -hmm. these two work similar since they help to fight the infection when we already have it. Now, it is very important that we do consume vitamin C from foods because our body does not make it and our body does not store it. Okay, which is why that many people that, who, that do have recurrent flus, they're lacking in vitamin C foods. Okay, and both of them, you find it in bright um, red colored um, fruits and vegetables, specifically tomatoes, oranges you can also find it in tangerine limes um, squash okay red and yellow bell peppers 
okay beans okay and most importantly green vegetables okay and then the main one with the highest source of vitamin c would be broccoli okay zinc is also important because zinc helps to improve the function of our immune cells you find zinc in a very limited amount of foods however you can find it mostly in mushrooms you can find it in spinach you can find it in tomatoes and also in some types of lean red meat as for probiotics it's not just good for your digestion but also good for your immune system yogurt is one of the best sources for probiotics the latest studies examining the COVID-19 outbreak show that 80% of the cases are mild, and those most vulnerable to severe illness are the elderly and the sick. The highest fatality rate is in people over 80. Similarly, the elderly are more susceptible to severe complications of regular flu and cold. That's because as we age, our immune systems can weaken. Normally, we do see the elderly with more um, tendency of having a flu or a cold okay because their immune system is a little bit low okay um, they also have a low intake of fluids okay and dehydration can also be a cause of having um, recurrent flus or recurrent cold okay so they they do have to con start consuming these foods that have all these nutrients that we mentioned the vitamin a vitamin c d and zinc okay because the older we get then the lower our levels become because we start to consume these food less and then the way our body processes it is a lot less than, than when we were younger as for the use of supplements sutherland says it's best to get nutrients from food but some can benefit from supplements you don't want to always recur to supplements for the treatment of just a cold it's better to get it from natural foods okay however if you're a person that has been hospitalized for pneumonia several times or you have a cold more than three or four times a year then you could probably use the supplements okay but it is always better to get it from the foods that you eat to date belize has no confirmed cases of covid19 either way start with your best defense a healthy immune system it will help you ward off the new virus and existing viruses like the flu that attempt to attack your body All right. Um, thank you. Uh, that was a great uh, video on boosting your immune system. Definitely, we all need to harder on consuming our fruits and vegetables throughout the day. It is recommended that you have at least, um, I believe it is two servings of fruit and three servings of vegetables throughout your day. Um, even if it's like a little snack, like a bell pepper with um some ranch or carrots with peanut butter it's always really good to keep something inside of your system like that um so that being said we have another uh census video for you um it is the pack the poles caravan video I also just want to let you all know about an event that's happening this Saturday October 24th which is actually National Early Voting Day where there will be a caravan going from the north side of the city to the south side of the city, stopping at different early voting locations to promote voting in the city. And this is actually a statewide event because a number of cities in Wisconsin are going to be having caravans in their city. And then at 2 p.m. there's going to be a press conference where all of the cities that are participating in this caravan will log on and just share information and promote voting. And at that point, the caravan in Milwaukee will be at Burnham Park when the press conference happens on that Zoom call. So as you can see, uh, Saturday will be starting at 10 a.m. at Midtown Mall on the north side, go through a couple different stops, and then at 1245 on Saturday, it will be at the Clinton Rose Senior Center where there will be some musical performances and then from there, it will come to the south side. So that will be at Burnham Park at 2 p.m. And then it will end at 3 p.m. at the Mitchell Park Domes. So they're making extra effort to make sure that this is a socially distanced event and that people are not conducting themselves in an unsafe way. So if you think that this is something you want to participate in, definitely drive up and be a part of this caravan. If not, there is the virtual option 
and we will share that Zoom link in our comments for people to participate. And again, just do what you can to promote this event. We want to make sure it's big and that it makes some noise in the city and inspires some people to get out and vote. All right, thank you, Gabe, for that update. Uh, definitely an interesting event to go to, and it's um, through social distancing, so you'll go in your car. Um, so that being said, I'm going to kind of see if we have any new hellos uh, for from our viewers. Um, so I see Malia Lohr um, says hello. Alan says hello. Um, and uh, of course, um, our Southside Organizing Center um, uh, is promoting that you don't forget your zinc and vitamin C. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. And I don't see any other hellos, uh, but yeah, love to see our viewers. Thank you for saying hello. Um, and now we have our um, census update. So just a quick census update for you. I'd like to announce that the census counting is now over. So um, that's over and the next one that will happen is in another decade. Um, thank you to anyone who made sure that they were counted, uh, such as the census workers that were going door to door trying to get individuals to complete their census. Uh, so. Thank you for that. Um, and now for our stock feature, we have Maria, one of our coworkers who is who did an interview with Ayuda Mutua. Hello, so for today's stock feature, we have Sebastian Daniel and Daisy Romero joining us from Ayuda Mutua. Hi guys. Look good. Um, so if you can just start off by telling me a little bit about Ayuda Mutua, how it got started, the purpose. Yeah, you want to start off with um with that, Daisy, or do you want to take that on? Well, yeah, no, I'll start off. So yeah, okay. um, first I want to thank you again for doing this, taking time out of your day to speak with us, um, just to raise awareness about what we're doing, and then hopefully get the word out for folks who do need support. Um, so I know, so, uh, Angela Harris is an MPS teacher and an activist and organizer. She put out a call for mutual aid on the North side and South side. Um, it was out of a need seeing that, uh, you know, students possibly weren't going to have access to food at that time, you know, during the inception of COVID. And so, um, <clears throat> that call was put out for mutual aid during that time. And our homie, Janet Martin, who's also a, a member of Ayuda Mutua, um, also um, put out a call to amplify that voice. Um, and so in response, uh, uh, Janet, uh, myself, CK, Eric, uh, Janet, um, and Janet Arellano, um, Gabby, and of course, Sebas and Alita, um, we formed what is called now Ayuda Mutua and KE. Um, and um, it started out as a translating, um, kind of ha translating documents and resources for Spanish speaking uh, siblings. And then it slowly evolved into providing food and hygiene products along with collecting and distributing food donations um, and resources for families in the Milwaukee area. Okay. Wanna add anything, Seda? Um, no, you, you would. You covered that perfectly. Um, I just want to add too, just in terms of the makeup of Ayuda, it's a it's a very um, amazing group of human beings, um, but a lot of experience as well. Um, besides having good hearts, um, you know, we have educators, we have environmental activists, we have community organizers, cultural workers, herbalists, um, artists within this collective. So it really brings. Uh, we kind of feed off of a lot of each other's energy and are, and are able to channel that um, through this Ayuda Mutua uh, MKE, Ayuda Mutua MKE work. Um, and so especially targeting obviously Spanish speaking communities in the 53215 and 53204 area codes, which we already know are communities that are vulnerable. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of our families too, 
um, you know, being, you know, maybe not having documentation or not having access to transportation to pull up to the pantry, right? So we also do like delivery drives, uh, drop-offs as well, or we coordinate with volunteers and stuff. And so um, we really, we really, the model that we have, the mutual aid model, right, is like taking care of our own, divesting from oppressive systems that don't take care of us and investing in ourselves, in our community and in people. Um, and, and also realizing that the community will dictate and drive our work, right? We're not here saying, this is what you need. Um, this is what, you know, resources you should be aware of. A lot of our work, it's always driven by the community, right? Whether it be um, a call for housing resources and employment resources. So trying to like work as a bridge between our community and um, what we know what the possibilities are. Okay. Um, I know Daisy mentioned a little bit of the staff involved. Can you tell me more specifically like your guys' roles in Ayuda Mutua? Um, yeah, for sure. So um, we, we, this question is like funny because anytime people want to talk to us or, or anybody in the group, it's like, well, what's your title or what's your position? And it's like, um, for us, it's a very horizontal kind of um, approach. Um, and it's a very uh, leaderless kind of like, a, it's a collective framework. So none of us are um, managers, supervisor, director, all, all those kind of colonial, you know, words, we don't really we don't really use that inside the space. We are all leaders. Our capacities change at times. So we take turns leading, we take turns organizing, we take turns doing back end stuff, which entails a lot of, um, you know, graphic design, right? Like Yanet Martin is, is crazy with the graphic design. She's able to provide us with a lot of graphics and things like that. We got homies doing that reply to emails and messages that we get, um, which is every day. We have people who coordinate volunteer delivery drivers and people who are um, you know, volunteers in the pantry. We have people who are in the pantry organizing um, and distributing. So it's really no no titles. It's just um, like I said, we're just homies who are who are concerned and, and and plugged into our communities. And so no no member is more important than the other. And this is perfectly aligned with our values and mission. Okay, that's I like that. I like that a lot. Um, what are you guys' hours of operation and your location then? I could answer that. So Mondays uh, are our donations day, which is the day that we take in donations right now. Um, it is from noon till 2 p.m. Mondays again at Bounce, Milwaukee, and the address for that is 2801 South 5th, 5th Court. Um, it's right behind UMOS, so if you need to get tested and, <laughs> um, and you also need to grab a bag of produce or food, it's all right there. Um, and Tuesdays are distribution days from 5 to 7 p.m. at again at Bounce Milwaukee, same address. <clears throat> we also have pop-up days. Um, they're usually Fridays. Um, we've had pop-up days at Allen Field and Mitchell Park uh, at the Domes. And I believe we're going to have, um, a, if we haven't already, we'll have another pop up at La Fuente in Fuente High School. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so we we're always seeking donations and if you see if you send us a message on Facebook and we need to pick up donations, I'm one of the people that I'm down to pick up donations um, right now. Um, but as as a group we're all always taking donations also. I, I don't want to speak for everyone in the group, but I know I for sure like if if that time doesn't work, I also pick of donations. And what kind of donations? Uh, Sorry, what kind of donations do you guys accept? You wanna, you wanna add to that, or wanna share what kind of donations we're taking to us? Uh, sure. Um, it really, it really is kind of dependent on on the day. And like, for example, um, since we do distribute once a week, um, since we do have limited access to freezer space and fridge space, right? So it's super dependent, kind of, on what the donation is, but donations in terms of that you can always like bring in our hygiene products which is uh basically anything for like period products it can include toothbrushes toothpaste bars of soap mouthwash things of that nature and then obviously food right so we distribute everything from fresh foods canned foods right so we accept um non-perishable items crackers chips um uh like really um try to provide as well like fresh fruits we were able to get donations from um, partnered organizations so we're able to provide fresh stuff um, the day of so that's really beautiful so when we're able to supplement that with um, beans and rice and things that kind of have a longer shelf life um, it accommodates perfectly with with the care packages that we make 
Um, but yeah, tomatoes, potatoes, um, de lo que sea, de todo. Um, aceptamos muchas cosas. Y, y si no están seguros, if y'all aren't sure, um, just hit us up and ask, you know. Um, and so we're always down if we're able to and, and, and make it work. We're always more than willing to, to accept donations. Um, exactly. Yeah. I also want to add to that. Um, we also obviously take hygiene products, um, like diapers. There's a big need for diapers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We work with Milwaukee Diapers Mission. And so obviously, you know, diapers are expensive and just having children is expensive. So, um, so we're always taking that. We're taking diapers, uh, other hygiene products, like feminine hygiene products. Oh, feminine hygiene products, um, cleaning products, right? Anything you would use at home um, to disinfect, right? Because of COVID. Um, and also, like, um, I already shared, like, uh, paper towels, toilet paper. Um, anything that, you know, one would need at home, like home products, right? Cleaning products. Um, and then, again, hygiene products, like toothpaste, toothbrushes. Okay. All that good stuff. Um, we take all of that as well on Mondays, noon to 2 p.m. Okay. And then besides donations, are there any other ways that people or residents can volunteer or help out? Yes, 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 most definitely. Um, people can get involved by um, volunteering, obviously, at the pantry or at the mutual aid site itself. Um, you can volunteer to be a delivery driver which we provide you with the protocol. We provide you with the addresses where you need to drop off. You pull up to the space, we load up your car. It's very minimal work um, in terms of like the preparation for it. You pull up, take the care packages and drop them off. Um, and so we, we provide you with all the information for that. Um, and so those are the, our main two kind of uh, calls for action. So sometimes we have pop-ups like we just had one yesterday at Allen Field, right? Where um, members of Ayuda were able to be there, but like I said, capacities change, right? So um, we have a pop-up tomorrow, for example, where we are putting out a call for, for volunteers, right, to be there um, just to facilitate a little bit and help out with the flow of, of the line and things like that. But those would be the two main ways. And the best way to get plugged in there would be to go to our Facebook or Instagram page, or you could email us at ayudamutuamke at gmail.com. And any questions or concerns or, or ideas or thoughts or anything like that or connections, you could always hit us up through there and just try to get plugged in. Um, as well as finding our cash, or not our cash app, we should get on cash app though. Um, but our Venmo um, and PayPal as well can be found on our Facebook pages where you could just hit us up again. And we're always accepting uh, monetary uh, donations to try to just keep up with the demand that our hoods need um, in terms of food security. Um, yep. And then you could also just get involved just by plugging into your hoods, right? So our mutual aid model is just one example uh, of ways that, that we can take care of ourselves. So. I do encourage folks to get plugged in locally, apply pressure to um, local politics and all the men, mayors and things of that nature, and to collectively kind of just move as a unit and demand these changes that, that we need. Um, and so that's just like a, another way of showing up for each other to events or to different um, types of, of things of that nature to just build that community and that trust. Exactly. I also do want to add one of the things that we did do and um, was also provide mm -hmm. um, some support um, monetary support to our undocumented siblings um, because as many of our residents probably already know, especially on the South side, you know, they didn't receive um, the stimulus check that if you were a citizen, you were to receive, right? Um, and so, of course, none of our, our immigrant community received any of those checks. And so we did have a fund, a, a docu fund, and we distributed those funds um, back then, right? And so um, just a reminder to highlight, to just to add to what Seba said, right? Like there are these systems that have been set up that are already not set up to take care of us, right? Especially our more, most vulnerable populations, our black and brown, um, undocumented family. Um, yep. So just to keep that in mind, right? Why also mutual aid is so important. Um, not just with food, but like with other, other, just other things, right? Other other we need healthcare. we need other things to be able to function just basic access to healthcare, housing just like the basics right i think so um i just wanted to add to that yeah real quick too before um you know we we wrap up here i do want to uh put a plug in for um 
a Dia de los Muertos um, celebración uh, that's going to be going on that we're hosting. So obviously, hemos estado trabajando duro, ¿verdad? Eh, desde, desde el inicio de la pandemia. And so we want to kind of take a pause and, and time to also reflect and just give thanks to our ancestors, give thanks to those um, who have kind of led us to where we are now um, and also celebrate people who have passed that, um, you know, when those wounds are still fresh and um, just celebrate life and death with community and, and give a, a time to just collectively pause and, and be together. So on November 1st, um, between uh, the hours of three to seven, um, it's a Sunday, November 1st, we're going to be hosting a Amor Eterno Celebración de Dia de los Muertos. So if you would like to get plugged into that and, and just um, show up, or if you would like to share a picture of, um, you know, a, a loved one that has passed on to the next transitional stage, um, you're more than welcome. And you can find that info on our, on our Facebook page um, or Instagram page for sure. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, lastly, just to conclude, how can we get in contact with you? I know you mentioned your Gmail, but what is your Facebook and your Instagram? Um, Ayuda Mutua, N-K-E. Um, okay. For, for, for both, so it'd be A-Y-U-D-A, which means help in Spanish, Mutua, which means mutual, would be M-U-T-U-A, and then M-K-E. So I use a Mutua M-K-E. If you look that up on Facebook or Instagram, um, you should be able to find it. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Daisy and Sebastian, for our other information. <laughs> Has this live forum been informative and useful to you? What part of the forum could be improved or changed to make it better? Please take a quick survey that's located in the comments section so that we can keep 3 o'clock with SAC going for residents. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Uh, thank you, Ayuda Mutua staff and Maria for doing that survey. I mean, for doing that um, interview. Uh, we always love to get new resources for the community. Um, and then we have our survey monkey link for sock survey in the comment section if you'd like to complete that. Uh, so just some quick reminders. Our main guest for tomorrow is going to be Carissa Gibbons. She is from the Wisconsin Bike Fed. And um, I'd just like to say that solidar our solidarity goes out to those uh, friends and family members that are protesting and uh, are thoughts and prayers goes that goes out to those that have been affected by COVID-19 and those who have lost individuals to COVID-19. Uh, and that being said, I would like to leave you with our funder partner thank yous for today. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Hola, SAC viewers. My name is Andrea Rodriguez and I'm the leadership coordinator for Southside Organizing Center. We would like to thank everyone for supporting our three o'clock with stock live show and for completing our very important stock survey. In addition to thanking our residents for tuning in and for sharing our show, we would also like to thank the following sponsors, Wisconsin Voices, Community Development Block Grants, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructure Fund, Movement Voter Project, Catholic, Catholic Campaign for Human Development, Zilber Foundation, City of Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, Tides Foundation, City of Milwaukee Promise Zones, and all the faithful individuals like yourself who support SOC through their personal donations. Gracias.